And good evening, and once again, welcome to another edition of the Shadow Gallery. I am, as always, your host, James Donnelly, and since it's Monday night, that means it's time for what we, as in me, like to call New Comics Bitches! And if you know how to read, which all of you do, since you're here, uh, you've seen the title of this video, and yes, we are now not live, but we, as in me, <laughs> the Shadow Gallery is now on iTunes, thanks to the ungodly help of just one trans fan who has done some amazing, remarkable work for me for no reward, just to, just to do it. And I don't know if it was just an experiment that you were having fun with, guy, but this is fucking amazing. I, you know, I have my wife's iPhone here. It's now all tangled up and shit. Um, but, ah... Uh, 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 but um, uh, you know, I, I downloaded the the podcast uh, thing on it, and yes. So if you have iTunes or if you have access to iTunes, if you have an iPhone, iPad, whatever, you don't have to just watch me. You can now just listen to me on iTunes. If you go to uh, either if you have the podcast app or if you search podcast, the iTunes store, you will see that all of the episodes of this format of the Shadow Gallery, not the old 15 minute at a time format, but all of the new like hour plus shows are now on iTunes. So you go to the pot, you go to the podcast section, you search for the Shadow Gallery and you will find me there. You'll see my awesome logo that uh, I co-created with him. Uh, my uh, very silly drawing with his awesome graphic that he created. Uh, I'm just in awe of this guy. I, I, I'm, I, I just I have no idea what to say about this. This has truly been uh, so exciting. Um, so that now, while you're, you know, if you if you just want to hear, I, I don't know how long that he intends to keep this up. <laughs> um, if he keeps putting them on, I will keep uh, letting you know. Um, but all of, except for this one, obviously, all of the new comics bitches and each of the, you know, all of the different, uh, you know, kind of, you know, vlogs that I've done are all up and available through the Shadow Gallery on iTunes. So that's just, to me, that's a huge deal. And I cannot thank you enough. I've said a lot of thanks in the emails that we've traded back and forth, but, you know, just seriously, this is awesome stuff. So uh, I could not be happier with the way that it's turned out. And it just, it, it feels great to, you know, to be on iTunes. So make me more popular than Gangnam Style. Um, <laughs> no, that's not going to happen, but it'd be nice. Um, anyway, so we're here to talk about comics, right? Right. So let's begin. Uh, where do we normally begin? We normally begin, well, okay, I made a little bit of change this week um, because there were a lot of books that came out this week, a lot of great books that came out this week. Uh, some not so good ones, um, and I, I'm trying to kind of focus on what I know that you all are reading, or focus on, uh, excuse me, uh, what, um, what I think you should be reading. So some of the stuff that, you know, I'm going to still collect but not talk about, uh, you know, stuff like, you know, Aquaman and, uh, you know, Jennifer Blood and, you know, so on and so forth. This is stuff I'm just basically going to stop uh, 
really talking about because I know that none of you out there are reading it or you're waiting for the trades or whatever. But you know, I because you know, and I, I've talked obviously a lot about uh, Valiant, um, but none of you are, are really buying Valiant yet. You're kind of waiting for the trades. I get it; it's expensive. Um, but uh, I'll continue to talk about those, but I think I'll be kind of dialing it back a little bit. And just really talking about the stuff that I know that you guys are either reading or, like I said, that I, I think that you should be reading. So this is kind of, you know, but of course, you know, we're going to be getting into, uh, you know, kind of the, you know, so we've got this next wave of Marvel Now coming out. And, you know, so I mean, there's a lot of stuff to still talk about, believe me. And there's a lot of stuff that I'll be talking about tonight. Uh, so let's uh, let's jump right in. Um, so I I did this one first uh, the last time this came out, and I'm doing it first again. But it is a dramatic change in quality, and that is Uncanny Avengers number two. So basically, what we've got here, I'm just gonna really sum this one up. Uh, Logan is sad. She's walking around like a sad sack uh, throughout, you know, throughout New York City. Uh, Cap is preachy. Uh, Havoc is in the background getting hugs uh, from civilians that he helped to save. Thor is pissed. Um, and the Red Skull has the brain of Charles Xavier. And apparently he has cut out the part of the brain that has made him such a super psychic and he's put it into his own head. I don't know. Uh, I have no idea how this process works. Um, whether we'll be getting more into that as issues go on, I don't know. Uh, but... This was just a slog of a read to get through um, because everybody's just, you know, uh, it just seemed like, you know, Logan was just too, he seemed too out of place here. Um, like he is, you know, because he has to be in as many titles as possible in Marvel, um, so there, here's more. You know, that's just, it, uh, I, I, I wasn't too pleased with Wolverine coming on board anyway, because, like, shit, the man's got, you know, so many other books that he's in, let's, you know, although he is leaving one, because one is ending, um, so he won't be part of that team anymore, but, uh, although, who knows? See, I don't know the rosters for some of the stuff that's upcoming, so, uh, but anyway... Um, so we have, uh, there are some nice moments in this book. Don't get me wrong. There are some really cool moments. Uh, you know, for instance, you know, uh, rogues kind of escape, you know, would be escape from, uh, the clutches of the Red Skull, um, a Red Skull using kind of his newfound powers and newfound influence on Wanda, um, but there's some stuff that's just like, you know, I don't need to know about the kinky bondage games that Rogue and Gambit used to play. Um, I don't need this book to overly focus on uh, Rogue kind of being uh, Magneto's bitch for a while, or whore, as uh, Red Skull kept calling her. Um, and, uh, you know, just... His character is written very well. I have to admit, Red Skull is written very well here. Um, just everybody else seems so kind of cardboard cutouty in this issue, which was uh, kind of a, a real tonal shift from the last issue, where it seemed like, okay, well, everybody's voice was very clear and distinct. Uh, Remender uh, knew who he was writing. Um, but this just seems like, okay, well, this is a, a really talky issue. Um, even Cassidy seems off his game here. He seemed to, 
and not really put a whole lot of detail into the work like he normally does. But again, you know, Cassidy is not an artist that is well known for meeting his deadlines. So maybe, you know, this is, I don't know, because I've never read anything of Cassidy's that really came out on kind of like the monthly basis that wasn't done well, well, well in advance. Um, you know, because obviously the, the, the only thing I really know him from is, uh, you know, is, a, you know, his run with Whedon on Astonishing X-Men. Um, where that was obviously, it was a, you know, for 25 issues that came out, it was a, you know, there were some breaks that were really long in between issues. But again, that's, I would prefer uh, long breaks with great stuff to, like, infinitesimal breaks with not-so-good stuff. Um, so this was just, uh, you know, like, s some moments of shock, some, you know, some genuine moments where they see, you know, uh, you know, where uh, Wanda and uh, and Rogue, who have been fighting again, but this time because uh, Wanda's under the influence of uh, of the Red Skull, uh, sees the body of Charles Xavier with his you know skull cut open and his brain is gone. I mean, that's it's a pretty terrifying shit there, and it's in those moments, those character moments, those quote unquote acting moments that. Uh, Cassidy's work really shows through. Um, but, like I said, it, it just didn't seem quite as detailed as his work normally does. So this book, to me, was a two and a half out of five. It was just, it, you know, it started really well, and then, um, well, it's kind of like, near. I, and I, I don't want to keep going down. I will stick with it. I will keep reading it until it either it, it, well, if it gets better, great. If it doesn't, then, you know, it's time to kind of wash my hands of it, despite the fact that it's John Cassidy on art. So, um, going on to a much better book, and that is All New X-Men number two. Uh, so it's interesting how this book has really, it's snap. I mean, it's, it's coming out fast. Um, because, I mean, Bendis has kind of relieved himself of all of his other duties right now and is kind of concentrating on, uh, you know, books like this. And I know that he's got some other new books that are coming out, but he's kind of lightening his load. Um, I know that Scarlet's coming back soon. I don't know when exactly, but I thought I saw a solicit for it, um, that it would be coming out again soon. So I'm looking forward to that. But, um... You know, and obviously he has Daredevil End of Days uh, that he's working on, but that's an old story. So, and you know, he was working on that with uh, with David Mack. So, you know, it's kind of taking some of the burden off of this stuff. So, I mean, it's giving more pop to uh, this story. This was a terrific issue um, in which we basically have the quote unquote the little X Men. Um, you know, Hank is there. He's kind of dealing with you know, his, you know, his younger self, you know, just all of his friends from when he was a, a young man, and, you know, basically telling them all of the horrible shit that some of them are going to either go through or going to do. So, I mean, it's really, uh, you know, and they finally get brought into the present, thanks to Hank, and of course, Hank is still having some problems. There's something wrong with him. And we don't find out until later in the book exactly what is going on with him. And, of course, it's, it's due to younger Hank's insight into himself. He knows how he would think and how he would react. Um, and they do get, you know, pushed, nudged, if you will, into the future. Um, and... Uh, of course, you know, once they show up on the, at the Jean Grey Institute, Wolverine's there teaching a ninja class, um, catches a whiff of something very, very familiar and splits and starts to go on the attack because there's no way this person could possibly be here. And of course, that's Jean Grey. 
Um, and it also happens to be Scott Summers. Uh, so one person he knows to be dead and another person that he really, really hates right now. Um, and this is unfortunately where... Uh, so we get to see these young X-Men react sort of to their to their own future. One of them, you know, Iceman meeting Iceman was a, a great moment. It was it was wonderful um, the way that they react to one another, um, and uh, of course, you know, Scott discovering what he eventually becomes, and uh, and Angel doesn't want to know anything about what's going on with him. He's the only one that's like, I don't want to know what's going on. Okay, uh, he of course will eventually find out but he doesn't want to know for right now. But of course, we also learned that, you know, Jean had learns herself that she dies. Um, and so what are we seeing in this title though? Is the elder Hank going to die? And that the younger one will somehow take his place? But those questions are part and parcel. They're, they're, they have nothing to do with what's going on right now in this issue, really. Because what I see this series as right now, and what I like so much about it, is that we still have what, what has been introduced into this timeline is the original five X-Men. As young, innocent, and idealistic as they ever were, and obviously some of that idealism is clouded, as we saw in the first issue, but, you know, particularly by Bobby and Hank, but to kind of see uh, their kind of, their youthful innocence kind of being tread upon here, but still maintaining it, uh, is something that I think is a really, really positive step in order to making... A, a really good X title because if you look at what we have right now I mean everything you know with the exception of Wolverine and the X-Men which you know obviously has death but I mean it's you know in some very sorrowful moments but it's it's very um, you know but it's 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 a more fun comic but most of the X titles are really dark and dour and depressing um, you know, because there's all this extinction level shit going on all the time. And, you know, we, ha and so with this title, we have, again, that freshness of these, you know, at the time, new characters being brought into this world that has kind of grown past that idealism. And that's what attracts me to this book. So, uh, and, you know, of course, Stuart, uh, Imonen, Imonen, however you pronounce it, they'll never get it right until I actually see the guy or hear the guy or hear somebody speak his name, uh, just does a fantastic job on art here. There's a great moment with Wolverine, although you kind of see it coming. Um, and, but again, it feels, it's, it's a little brief, you know, and that is, of course, it's a problem, but it's something that you get over. So uh, this was all in all... A really terrific read. Bendis doing some just terrific character work. Uh, Manon doing terrific, terrific art. Absolute four and a half out of five for all new X Men number two. Uh, Secret Avengers number 34. Um, this is a bit of a mixed bag um, because we do open with kind of the destruction of their secret kind of satellite base uh, from, you know, the descendants. Uh, you know, we see, of course, that Eric O'Grady has completely turned traitor. Um, and, you know, here's, you know, Venom kind of floating out in space along with uh, Valkyrie. Uh, and, you know, he's trying to get himself to a place where we he can get the device that will actually, you know, unleash uh, the vent, the symbiote, so that he can bond with it, and that he can save Valkyrie and get back on the satellite before it completely gets blown up. And uh, of course, here comes Black Widow to save them. Um, but what this issue really comes down to is that Hawkeye and Captain Britain, because they're looking for this uh, this orb of necromancy. 
uh, that is being used by Father, the one that's the leader of all the descendants, um, so that they can counter whatever it, it is, whatever this plan is that's going on. And they're kicking it in Earth 666, which of course has all the demonic uh, versions of uh, the Avengers, inc including uh, famously Frankencastle, you know, which is just that segment of the book is incredibly fun. And I wanted, I just wanted this whole fucking time, I just wanted this whole fucking issue to be that. I wanted to be Hawkeye and Captain Britain just doing their thing in Earth 666 because it is tremendously entertaining. Uh, Mateo Scalera's uh, art style is a little good, it's a little scratchy, um, and that can be a little grating sometimes, um, but this was easily when the book was at its best because it was allowing Remender to really have fun in this situation with kind of the absurdity of where it is, and but also show this you know some really nice character moments for a character that I think and have long thought has not really gotten his due, and that's Captain Britain, um, because I fucking love Captain Britain. See, here's my little here's my little Captain Britain right here, and he's the shit. I love this guy. And I, you know, I'm, I'm sick of him, of seeing him getting shortchanged. And, you know, what we're seeing here is, you know, Hawkeye is kind of, you know, seeing, yeah, this, this guy polices the omniverse, okay? You know, so, I mean, you know, Hawkeye may be leader of the team, but, you know, Captain Britain is definitely not a slouch because he just happens to be dealing with everything. <laughs> you know, it's just that he can't always get, you know, very directly involved. And which is why I'm still desperate to see a Captain Britain solo, or not necessarily solo, but his own series. Because, you know, if you look at the people that have worked with him over the years, I mean, you know, Alan Moore, Jamie Delano, uh, you know, Chris Claremont, of course. Um, you know, in fact, if you think back to House of M, you know, his, his particular story arc, Captain Britain's story arc, was easily uh, the most impressive to me. Um, but uh, I think that was the X-Men House of M part, whatever. I don't know. I can't really remember. But I want more of him back because, God, did I love Captain Brenton and MI-13. It was one of my favorite series, and just more stuff with him is great. But anyway, back to this issue. Um, so that uh, we cut back to, you know, the Descendants and the Super Adaptoids meeting and everything like that. Um, and they're kind of discussing, you know, how, you know, and even bringing Jim Hammond, the original Human Torch, into the fold, him kind of accepting his destiny there, um, maybe, we're not quite sure, um, but that they intend to kind of open the horizons of all human minds. Um, that seems to be kind of their end game here, is that they're allowing kind of each human to almost be kind of godlike in their awareness. Uh, so, um, I don't really see how that's a bad thing, but obviously it's, it's bad, um, because there's something else behind it. Um, and, but what we also have is, uh, we see, uh, Hank getting a bit of a mank over here, Hank Pym, uh, because, uh, here comes Wasp to somehow put him through this weird machine. This was a really kind of unsettling moment here because you know you know here's wasp in this all distorted fucked up fashion and you know it's all this kind of crazy badness that's going on uh so this was you know that that's a little bit hard to take uh, at points but uh, you know i mean it's it's short but it's it's very very creepy um so this was by and large a, a you know, a good, fun read. I just wish more of the good and fun had intersected with the rest of the book. Um, so, uh, four out of five for uh, Secret Avengers, uh, number 34. Um, like I said, just wanted more. Um, Ultimate X-Men, number 19. So, here they are on Reservation X. So, I mean, the book opens with them getting there. Paco Medina is back on art. Great stuff. And uh, we have... Uh, basically, Kitty and you know, kind of the remainder of the mutants, and we have you know, uh, you know, some of these other kind of quote unquote new mutants, and you know, we have you know Betsy Braddock, you know, we have you know Psylocke, and you know, of course we have Mach Two, 
and you know all of the other uh, Ultimate X Men who are kind of you know they're basically you know Storm so on and so forth. We have yet to see what happened with Colossus, um, so I'm sure he'll be making an appearance sooner or later. But um, you know basically that this whole area of Utah, which of course is almost kind of like an irradiated wasteland. Um, you know, white sands and everything like that is their home. They are, it's a sovereign nation unto itself. And uh, mutants will be protected. They will be supplied with food, shelter, and protection from the U.S. government, or by the U.S. government, I should say. Um, but if they step off of Reservation X, they will be considered illegals, and they will be shot, uh, or unpleasantly dealt with. Um, so this was kind of, you know, the... Hmm, kind of the deal with the devil that they brokered with Captain America, which is, this is the part, I guess, that, that kind of uh, doesn't jibe quite right with me, is that I understand the agreement that they made, but the fact that it comes with all of these caveats seems to be very non Captain America y. You know, this like this is something that he would allow to have happen. Uh, you know, where where he's trying to foster some, you know, faith and, you know, some uh, you know some goodwill amongst the mutants, which, you know, but I think that ultimately this did end up being kind of a political decision more than anything on his part. And of course, you know, politics can't exist in a vacuum. There have to be other people that have signed off on this idea, uh, technically. Uh, well, actually not so technically, because, you know, there's all the executive privilege and so on and so forth. So, I mean, anyway. That's that's too. I don't want to get into that area of things because that way lies madness when we talk about politics on here. So, um, and of course, once they're there, it starts to split because there's immediately dissension in the ranks because Kitty is viewed as, you know, by, you know, by you know, like one half there to be a little bit more than half. Uh, to be kind of the the future of the mutant race, uh, you know, the leader, and, you know, of course, and then, you know, Mach 2 and kind of those along her uh, ideals believe Kitty to be the ultimate traitor. Uh, and so they split almost right down the middle, and, you know, they do take a democratic vote to see who will end up kind of leading... Uh, this group, but of course, you know, with all this dissension in the ranks, there's bound to be, you know, something that ends up going wrong, because you have them all together, and they think of, you know, really great ways in which they can, you know, you know, because they have the, the one that can kind of, you know, he can extract, you know, he can extract, you know, kind of all of the poisons from the, from the sand and everything like that, and he can make the ground fertile again, uh, but it just will take a long time. And they got a guy who just deals specifically with plants, so he's a guy to have handy around. But of course, he's on Mach 2's side, um, and you know, so you've got all of this kind of planning and scheming. You get this mystery package from you know from Nick Fury to Kitty. Uh, you know, of course, when we find out what's in it, um, it does not bring a great deal of hope for the future. Um, so there is this kind of great darkness that looms over this group. Uh, despite the fact they now have their, their own land that they can call home and that nobody can fuck with them. Um, but still, they're not allowed to kind of live and exist and coexist with the rest of the world. So, and of course, there is a potential threat that is from without as well as within. Um, and, uh, you know, the, this new version of Jean Grey, uh, you know, because she's, you know, in Seer, in The Seer, whatever, and, you know, she's kind of a bitch, it seems like. Maybe not. We don't know yet. We're, we're uncertain. We are uncertain as to her motivations yet, which is what is 
you know, her as now Karen Grant uh, is kind of exciting to see unfold. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, but this was just, I thought um, it's because it is kind of following this kind of almost, let me just say, it, kind of tired uh, idea of, okay, well, you know, we have, you know, there is, you know, kind of a walking dead, uh, if I can use that comparison, um, kind of feel to, okay, well, you know, or just that it's human nature, that, you know, once we get into our own little patches of whatever, we still have to divide ourselves. Um, so, I mean, you know, we just finish up the arc that says, you know, divided, you know, divided we fall. And you'd think that they'd learn from that, you know, that the mutants would learn from that. But again, you know, ideals, realities collide. And it's, it's a hard thing for all of them to, uh, to process. And uh, I'm looking forward to where this book is bringing us. But like I said, it's, this, this issue just felt a little bit too familiar to me. So this was, you know, this was a four out of five. It's still a really good read, a very compelling read. But again, like I said, it, it feels a little too formulaic for what I want to see from someone like Brian Wood on this book now, who has, you know, brought such life and vitality to this book. So, uh, and a quick blurb, uh, because I just enjoy kind of talking about this, and that's uh, Captain America and Black Widow number 639. Um, you know, you've got this whole, uh, you know, weird, you know, uh, uh, Venom and Multiversal and everything like that. And, uh, and you've got, you know, good Black Widow, bad Black Widow, Captain America, uh, you know, in these crazy worlds and everything like that. And they're kind of being transported back and forth. Um, and <laughs> it's just... It, who, who cares what it's about, really? Because even though there is actually a, kind of an interesting story that I've seen growing here uh, as I've been reading it, because the only reason I even picked it up in the first place was because of Francesco Francavilla's art, which is phenomenal! Um, and it just, you know, it looks great. It has this really nice kind of, you know, pulpy sci-fi feel to it, even though, you know, it's like, it's weird because, you know, they, they talk about kind of like the neo-noir aspects of, of this book, and I'm like, I'm not seeing that really at all. I'm seeing uh, that uh, Colin Bunn and Francesco Francavilla, that basically Colin Bunn just kind of said, here, Francesco, do some fun stuff. You know, make some really cool visuals, have it be kind of pulpy, kind of fun, kind of science fiction-y, you know, kind of old school science fiction, you know, War of the Worlds type stuff. Uh, Flash Gordon type stuff, and he does that brilliantly. And he, there's even kind of like on this other world, uh, you know, there's an Octo Lizard, and he's a good guy. You know, he's he's got the Doctor Octopus arms, but he's Kurt Connors. He's the Lizard. Um, and so, I mean, there there's some interesting ideas here. They don't really come very well to fruition, at least in my opinion, because it's not a very it's not an incredibly compelling read, but it is a really it's really gorgeous to look at. Um, because, you know, Frank Avia does, you know, all the art, all the painting, all the colors, you know, it's all, and it all looks fantastic, and I just love it. Um, but it's, it's a, you know, from a story standpoint, it's maybe two and a half out of five, from an art standpoint, it's a five out of five. So this is, you know, a good three and a half, I would say. Um, so, uh, moving on to the independence this week. Um, and uh, we're going to talk first about Bedlam, number two. Uh, Bedlam is getting uh, increasingly deranged. <laughs> um, you know, as we open up with, you know, just kind of like this two old buddies talking type of thing, and you just feel from the get-go that something while, because it's so normal, it seems so, you know, it seems so normal that something is going to go horribly wrong for one of these two guys, um, or both of them. Uh, so, uh, and of course, something really or horrible does, uh, and then, of course, that brings us to Fillmore Press, 
and uh, you know, as we see him kind of in his delirium uh, as he's recovering from you know his gunshot wounds from the from the last issue, uh, you know, and we see uh, you know these this strain you know these strange doctors and you know the strange doctor and these strange nurses who are you know who have believe that they have successfully rehabilitated and made you know basically disposed with the persona of matter red and so that Fillmore is someone that is you know he understands who he was but now he wants to he wants to become more civic minded <laughs> he wants to contribute something to society even though he knows that he's still a loon. Um, and we have these great moments between him and the doctor, and then we have the cops, uh, and, you know, kind of, you know, th them seeing, you know, this, this discussion with Fillmore that, you know, he, that he's kind of giving his opinions about what this killer of the senior citizens is, is doing, um, that we see that this, you know, this person that she was talking to must be the perp. It must be because there's no way else they can think like this. I mean, because it's almost kind of Dexterish in its uh, uh, in its uh, in its storytelling, in the sense that you know we have someone with the mind of a serial killer and a you know a, a deep psychopath uh, psychopathology. Um, and but he now wants to use that force he wants to use that part of his mind to the betterment of the citizens of bedlam um so we don't the the only thing the thing that really kind of did bother me because riley rosmo's art is terrific i'm i'm really really digging the art for this book uh, Spencer writes the characters beautifully. However, there's not a lot of expansion to the universe as of yet because this is obviously very much a book that's in its infancy. It's only the second issue. Um, but I feel that there's more to this book that it might have needed to get to before it leads to the place that it ends at. Um, so I felt like, despite the fact that it's a, a very dense read and it's, you know, a really kind of traumatizing read, because, I mean, you look at the pages and you're just, your mind is like, you, your mind does get fucked with because Rosimo's art is so kind of crazy and scratchy and psychotic that it, it does breed this kind of uncomfortable feeling throughout the whole book, but having these moments of you know, very kind of uncomfortable humor um, that uh, that Spencer breeds into, you know, the, the Doctor and, and, and very much into Fillmore. So, I mean, this is a book that I, I think has the potential to be really great. Um, but I think it needs to, uh, it needs to not step up its game, but to, to work to, because we saw this huge universe uh, at least part of it that had already been somewhat established and to kind of come at it from this angle felt a little off to me so uh, but still a, you know a really really solid read four and a half out of five for Bedlam number two I just think that uh, there's more that needs to be discussed here because the characters that were introduced in this first issue, we need to see more of them. But I, but I appreciate what Spencer's going for at the same time, is he's wanting to focus on character and not necessarily forward momentum and the expansion of the universe. So, hmm. sorry, my throat's really dry. Um, speaking of Nick Spencer, Morning Glories, number 23. It seems like it's been a long time since this book's come out. Um, but anyway, I'm sure it was the same time last month. Uh, so we have... Uh, <laughs> it's hard to even talk about this book, man, because it is... It's so fucking crazed. And because it is so... It's so amazing that, you know, it really is... One question gets answered ten more 
spring up in its place because we have you know these flashbacks and these flash forwards and so on and so forth and it really does you know like I you know obviously the book can be compared ad nauseum to Lost but sometimes it really does show that influence and this is one of those issues where it is showing you know we have the past with the truants we have arena you know kind of really showing what a kind of a terrifying girl that she is um and we have everything kind of going on with fortunato and akiko and the sacrifice that you know that needs to be made you know sacrifice must be made and we see you know hisao and you know guillaume and uh you know everybody they, they see uh who they're who needs to be sacrificed and ultimately of course it's jun um or Hisao, I get, you know, it's, it's one of those things, it is really confusing because they are twins and we don't know who, is, you know, we know that Hisao is the good one, we know that Jun is now the, the not so good one, uh, but Hisao is still going to do what he needs to do to try to save his brother, even if it means kind of falling out of grace with the, uh, with his brothers and sisters that are the truants. Um, and yes, there is good reason to be afraid of Irina here. Um, it's and and you know when we get to certain moments, it's like I I don't know what's going on here, but I love it, <laughs> you know. Um, and you know, and then we finally at the end of kind of all this mixed in insanity, here we have Jade and Ike kind of their odd coupleness kind of, you know, wandering out of the woods and just kind of not so much picking up where we left off with them, but we've kind of almost, we, they've gone kind of past that and they're just kind of, they're just kind of talking. And then all of a sudden, boom, something's wrong again. We have this great cliffhanger and it's like, uh, shucks. I mean, it's like, fuck. I, I mean, this, it, you know, it's for a 32 page book, it always seems short. Because I want more, and I, I gotta say, Joe Eisma is definitely, you know, the, he's only working on this book, to the best of my knowledge, and that's fine with me. Because if Joe Eisma does this from, you know, for the rest of his life, for this title, that's totally fine with me, and that's the only thing he does because he does it so incredibly well. He draws the shit out of this book. It is, every character is so, so well detailed and so clearly delineated. And like I said, those, we, we were starting to talk more and more about this because I've been reading more, more I've been reading more uh, reviews online and, and the word acting does get thrown around a lot in when it comes to comic books because yes what we have here these characters they are even though they are these characters they are still acting a part and they have to ha they have to be expressive and that is one thing that Joe Eisma is so brilliant at is his expressiveness in his characters you know when they're happy you know when they're sad you know when they're indifferent uh, which is very rare, you, you know, when they're confused, you know, when they're afraid. I mean, it is something that he does so very well. And Nick Spencer does, again, some brilliant character work here, but only quibble, and it is unfortunately kind of, not a big one, but a, it's a, it's a medium-sized one, is that I think this book might be wearing a little bit too much of its lostness on its sleeve, at least in this particular issue. I felt that it's really starting to feel, I am literally expecting like, okay, we're gonna see a smoke monster in like two or three issues. Uh, that's kind of what I feel. You know, that there is a Ben Linus in here somewhere. Um, but, you know, all of these great character moments, you know, it's still, it, it, all of this is just, Really, really excellent comic book storytelling. I just wish, like I said, that this particular issue didn't quite wear its influences so much on its sleeve. Um, so I give this a... Uh, 
a hesitant four and a half out of five. It's really close to five, uh, but just doesn't quite hit the mark. Um, so, moving along, um, out on to DC, uh, and is that uh, Talon number two? Now, uh, obviously, this is a book that's also very much in its infancy. You know, these are brand new characters. These are, you know, brand new, you know, uh, well, not brand new, but, I mean, because obviously we know about the Quarter Owls, but we're exploring that universe now. And with Calvin Rose and Sebastian Clark, who I don't think is Bruce Wayne anymore, I thought that was kind of a fun idea at first, but, ugh. Sorry, my neck um, it is definitely not. Uh, he's definitely, this is definitely not Bruce Wayne. Um, it just happens to be another old rich guy with uh, some very specific ideas about. Uh, he knows just what monsters the Court of Owls can be because he's experienced it firsthand. Uh, and we're starting to see the development of these characters, and we even start to see the development of some of the kind of people that they end up going after because. Of course, Calvin's main mission here is not, you know, Sebastian and Calvin are working together, but it's kind of a, uh, it, it seems like it'd be a match kind of made in heaven. Uh, but of course, this is a very begrudging, uh, uh, it's, it's, it, it's now becoming a very begrudging partnership as we, as we see here in this issue, because they're going to, uh, they're going to this specific hotel that on the very top floor has uh, something that uh, Sebastian wants. Uh, but also Calvin believes, you know, that it's not only something that uh, Sebastian wants, but he knows that if you, you know, that uh, some of these items that they have here get destroyed, then it will really put a dent in the court's finances. Um, and so, of course, he meets, uh, you know, Calvin does his whole kind of escape artisty thing. Um, but, of course, it kind of fucks up because he does kind of go a little bit off book here um, during the mission. And, uh, but there's, you know, a really neat invention that, you know, that, uh, that Calvin came up with. But, you know, it's like a couple years ago, but it only took, you know, uh, Sebastian a week to make it, and it's this device that throws sound for, like, as far away as 200 feet, so it will sound like, you know, someone is way over there, when, of course, they're, you know, they could be right behind you. Um, so, I mean, that's just all part of his kind of, you know, this kind of, you know, almost circus training, misdirection, you know, escape artist thing, and that part of that character is something that I really think is cool. Um, the, uh, you know, so, uh, but what Calvin really wants, the only thing that he really sees right now, he's, he's very laser focused on, is the, uh, the saving of the, the, you know, the first two people that he was assigned to kill. Um, you know, that they will be, they will ultimately be, be victims of the Court of Owls. And he needs to get to them before the court decides to you know, killed them. So, and of course he meets another Talon, uh, whose, you know, his father was one of the grandmasters of the, the court. And, uh, he, and Calvin sees some of himself in this other Talon, and after fighting him, and after, you know, pulling off, you know, again, one of these, uh, you know, kind of patented escape type moments, he actually wants to, you know, this guy that he's been fighting, he sees the struggle uh, that he has with, you know, with him being just another, you know, being a talent, and he wants to bring him with, he wants to save him, because what he's done is going to bring down this whole place, and, you know, burn him alive, even with the regenerative powers, you know, he, you know, this, you know, his opponent will die, but he's trying to, again, foster, you know, like I've said before in this, in, uh, in this broadcast, you know, he's trying to make things better, uh, 
so that it isn't just a constant cycle of combat. Um, and that he can show the Talons that there is another way to live and survive. Um, but of course, that doesn't go as planned. Uh, and of course, we have this kind of, uh, you know, this uh, war of words between Calvin and Sebastian. And we see why Sebastian really kind of has such a, you know, such a mad on to go after the court. And of course, we cut to this this kind of great ending scene where a new character is going to get introduced here, and this is going to be an incredibly evil character. Um, I mean, we just know from the get go that this is going to be a really bad dude, because even when he was a Talon, he, uh, you know, he just killed people just because it was fun. Um, so. You know, even though the court plans to bring him back with all these safeguards and everything like that, like, yeah, that's going to work. Um, whether or not we'll see Lincoln March ever come up in this, uh, that's, that's something that, uh, you know, is obviously... There's a lot of speculation, because what I'm seeing here is that... What I'm seeing here with this book is that this is a strong opening to what could be a really compelling series. Um, it is building. It is, you know, it, it's kind of... It feels a little formulaic right now. It feels almost kind of like uh, the show Person of Interest, um, if you if you watch that, which is I think is a, is a terrific show. It's a it's a really entertaining program, and you have almost kind of this you know you have the mysterious financier and you have the guy who does the kind of the grunt work, um, and uh, they both kind of have their own agendas, um, but. Uh, you know, uh, neither of them are, you know, neither Sebastian nor Calvin are bad guys. They're just, they just disagree with the way that they need to do things for, uh, you know, for the good of, you know, of everybody and also to take down the court because the court is way, way fucked up. So they need to go. Uh, so, but this is, you know, it's a really strong moment. I was not a huge fan of, uh, of Jose, uh, uh, Juan Jose Rip's art. Um, I thought it was a little too uh, squiggly in certain places. Um, I don't think that his uh, his character work was very. It, it wasn't as. Uh, it just didn't look as good as Guillaume March's stuff. So I don't know if uh, if Rip is going to be the guy that is going to be the artist here. But, you know, James Tinian and Scott Snyder, with, you know, some assists here, write a really, really good story. Uh, so this is a solid four out of five for, for talent number two. Again, this is one of those books you're, some of you are not reading, but I think that you should give a try. Um, uh, and on to Justice League Dark, number 14. This was uh, a really kind of all over the place issue for me. Um, I still liked it a lot. Um, but, you know, because we have at the opening here, we have, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, we have, you know, Constantine, Dead Man, uh, and, uh, you know, Xanadu are trying to find out what the hell happened, how they can track uh, what happened to Zatanna and, uh, and Tim Hunter. Um, you know, they're, they're looking for a way to kind of jumpstart the books of magic that can kind of reproduce the spell that, uh, that sucked uh, Tim and Zatanna away. Um, of course, the key to doing this, of course, is the traitorous Dr. Mist. Um, that's all kind of incidental to what's really going on in this book, is that we have a fun, very kind of almost, you know, horror film, sort of cabin in the woodsy uh, kind of uh, feel to, um, we have uh, Frankenstein, uh, Amy slash Amethyst, and Purple Orchid going into the house of mystery, and just kind of poking around in there. And of course, Frank's very much against this idea. He doesn't want them to do it, but, you know, they're kind of bored, just kind of sitting around, and so they want to explore a little bit. Of course, that does not end up well for them at all. Um, and there are some big, there is one big question to this, to this issue. Um, 
And it's not so much to do with the ending because here we have boop, the Phantom Stranger. Um, how is what he is, how is his appearance going to change the, change the game here? Um, I'm not so much interested in that, but the real question for me with this issue is whose files are those on the walls? Were those made by Constantine? Is he keeping track of all of these different people? Who ha whose files are they? That's what I want to know. I mean, they, I feel they must be Constantine's, but there has to be a different explanation, I feel. At least, you know, from... From a character standpoint, it does seem like something that Constantine would do. He would want to keep his eyes out on some of the the people that he might have to deal with. Um, but you know, at the same time, some of them seem a little bit I don't know, maybe too detailed for Constantine's style of work, uh, because he seems to have a very kind of cavalier attitude about things. Um, but, you know, we'll, I'm sure that we'll find out because uh, Purple Orchid, not too pleased about that. Uh, especially with, um, you know, Constantine's own reaction to Purple Orchid's, uh, her kind of ties to both the green and the red. Um, you know, it's like, so, you know, how, if, she, he, if Constantine's got a file on her, why would he need to even ask that? You know, as we saw in a couple of issues ago. So, um... Boy, howdy. I mean, it was just uh, it's just terrific. Another terrific read uh, from Lemire and company. Um, the art's really nice. Uh, and it's just, I mean, this is a, just a terrific book. And again, this is another, uh, like I said, it was because it seemed kind of like off balance a little bit uh, tonally. Um, this is a four out of five, close to a four and a half, um, for Justice League Dark number 14. Uh, and so now we get into the picks of the week, the ones that scored Cinco out of Cinco. And there are, again, a lot of them. Uh, so we're going to start with uh, what was the biggest kind of uh, geekgasm for me this week. It wasn't my pick of the week, but it was... Mm, wonderfully, for me, this is like heaven. And that is masks number one. Now, I know that those of you, you're not tuning into the shadow, you're not really tuning into the spider, um, not really tuning into Green Hornet, Lone Ranger, Zorro, you know, all the pulp titles that Dynamite is now producing. Uh, but if the if these next two words can't somehow get you on board, then there's something wrong with you. And those two words are Alex fucking Ross. Alex Ross painted work, not just pencils, not just inks, painted by Alex Ross. So what we have here is this is taking place in the heyday of the pulp characters. And we open up with this awesome sequence between uh, Green, the Green Hornet and Kato, who are going after the, these underlings of this, uh, this big Chicago mob boss, uh, but uh, who happens along but the shadow. And now this is written by Chris Robinson. I have really no idea who this guy is. I don't know what else he's done. But holy shit, does he have an amazing handle on who exactly the shadow is. There are moments in this book that are so shadow awesome. It's just, it, it's like, where the fuck is this in the ongoing shadow title? Why isn't it there? Because Lamont Cranston has the moment. So, I mean, we have, you know, this great introduction to the Shadow with Green Hornet and Kato. He actually, you know, I mean, Kato, he's the big, you know, he's the big, you know, Kung Fu guy, and he gets kind of the smack laid on him by the Shadow. 
And so it's just like, yeah, this guy's a little bit out of their league. Um, because, you know, they definitely see this is a man really kind of without mercy. And he believes solely in the, the idea of justice. And that is something that is very much brought to bear in this issue. Uh, as we see that there is this, um, this, this new governor of New York, he's crooked as hell, uh, he's created this kind of fascistic uh, justice party. And it's almost literally like you know, Prince John and the Sheriff of Nottingham from Robin Hood. It's like they've created something that they are just, uh, they're levying taxes whenever they feel like it. They bring in anybody off the street if they feel like it. The law is somehow broken. And there's this great courtroom scene where we see just how broken it really is. Um, as, you know, kind of this young, quote-unquote, vagrant, uh, this young Hispanic vagrant from California comes to, work, comes to New York looking for work, and of course is picked up for vagrancy because he doesn't have a permanent address and all that kind of bullshit, um, but he has these drawings, and these drawings are of this, you know, this this uh, you know this masked man, in a black hat and black cloak, and uh, you know with a you know riding a riding a horse and wielding a rapier, and whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Um, and so we get we start to see uh, you know we see the uh, the personas you know the daytime personas of you know Lamont Cranston and Britt Reed. Um, and how they, you know, come to meet at the Cobalt Club. Yay! Um, we see Margot Lane there. Uh, and, you know, of course, then we have, we see this this moment where, you know, all of a sudden this, uh, this justice party and the justice kind of their guardians, you know, these, you know, kind of body-armored, almost like Stormtrooper-esque guys, uh, just decide to start levying new taxes and everybody just kind of has to give what they have on them. Everybody in the street, it's a new law. And this is where, you know, Greenhorn and Cato and the Shadow step in. They say, nope, enough of this bullshit. And they jump into the fray and boom, and they land there and they start, you know, the bullets are not penetrating the armor, the Shadow's shooting, uh, Green Hornet's stinger isn't working against them. What the hell do they do? They gotta fight hand to hand. Uh, but here comes another guy to help out, and this other guy is the spider. And he's got a bag of tricks, and he knows that they're gonna be needing them because this is—it's too big of a problem for just even a couple, even three masked men to take on. We're gonna need a fourth, and eventually a fifth. This, I mean, was so, I mean, it, it it filled me with such joy to read this book. It was really just, it was so gorgeous for one thing. Alex Ross, the level of detail that he puts into his work, the fact that you know Lamont Cranston has kind of the the nose, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, I mean, that he does have kind of like this almost Basil Rathbone. I mean, that's almost kind of the, uh, the look that uh, Alex Ross has given him is that he looks very much like Basil Rathbone, that he has, you know, kind of this, you know, enlarged, not, you know, like, not like huge Pinocchio nose, but he has, you know, this very well-defined nose that, you know, always is kind of like the, it's been one of the trademarks of the shadow because all you see is his eyes and his nose, you know, and then you have the scarf and you have the fedora. Um, but just, I mean, his his specificity in his character work, the level of detail that he puts in, just the tremendous thought and work that was put into this book, the design of it, it just looks, reads, absolutely fantastic it is just it's a huge joy to read and to absorb and this is absolutely if this had been any other week this would be the pick of the week but there are better books to to get to uh one of those better books 
is Eye Vampire number 14. Normally, again, this would be a pick of the week. Uh, but we have, um, you know, we have Deborah Dancer, we have Mary, we have, uh, we have John facing off against Andrew and Tig, you know, the totally now evil Andrew. Um, and, uh, you know, we see a little bit into the past of what the original, like, uh, you know, House of Mystery, I Vampire story arc was was doing with Deborah Dancer and with Mishkin, um, you know, it was basically the three of them against Mary, and you know, we hear about you know what happened with uh, Deborah, that she you know was sent to hell by uh, by Mary, um, and uh, she kind of, she finally came back, um, and you know we see her as kind of now like she is like the other kind of chief protagonist of this book now because you know Andrew Bennett is now the villain. I mean that's that's how much balls this book has. I mean it's this the, the fact that it can take you know that in you know in these 14 issues we've seen Andrew rise you know to the level of almost you know we've seen him die. We've seen him rise to a level of almost godlike power and now we see him completely turn evil because he sucked all of the essence of all these other vampires into him and just all of the evil came with it and of course it was the only solution that he had and now he has ultimately become his own worst nightmare um, and the fact that he turned Tig is you know kind of like the first his kind of first opening blow, and then of course depowering Mary uh, was a huge step as well. So, you know, again we have the moments with Mishkin the dog, and we have you know, you know these kind of comical moments, you know the, these great you know zippy lines from Mary and from John, um, and uh, you know this great characterization of what is ultimately a new character for this book, but is an old character for the, you know, for the, uh, uh, for the history of the character of Andrew Bennett. Um, you know, so they have, you know, they're, they're able to barely escape, you know, kind of their clutches, but of course, Andrew's got other plans. And so he seeks out this, you know, this young, mystic who you know just kind of goes to this bar looking to get laid and everything like that but he has no idea of the potential that he has you know i mean you know and but andrew bennett does uh because andrew bennett senses you know he says you know even you know even john constantine if he knew about you would piss his pants at the kind of powers that you have so you know now is your chance to start living up to them but there's one catch you have to become a vampire first and there's just, you know, these, these great, you know, character moments where we see, you know, how Fialkov has turned, uh, you know, just this whole book squarely on its head again, um, and how we're kind of dealing with that, with the, you know, with the fallout of everything that, uh, that Andrew is now doing, and how it's affecting his supporting cast. Um, and, you know, just, I mean, the moment where, you know, where Mary says, but I'm a monster for good, <laughs> you know, it's just like, it's so awesome, and you just, you gotta love it, and Sorrentino's art, as always, just dripping with gorgeousness, I am so fucking sad that he's leaving this book, I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I'm looking forward to the Green Arrow book that he's gonna be doing with Jeff Lemire, but, at the cost of him leaving this book, I, of course, as long as Fialkov is on it, I will keep reading it. Um, but the art is really a big part of what makes this book so great every single issue. So, five out of five, I Vampire number 14. 
Speaking of vampires, American Vampire number thirty-three. Now this is the fur. This is the 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 next to last issue before this book goes on a kind of temporary hiatus. Um, and this is the the finale of the Blacklist arc. And you know what we have here is of course the final confrontation between Pearl and Hattie. Um, the real final one you would think, because we have seen, obviously, some characters come back from the dead before, and one of them is in this very issue, of course, that's Skinner Sweet. And, you know, of course, this is all to protect, you know, to her racing to save Henry from, you know, and Hattie has all these sort of devious plans for, for her, for, for Henry, um, but Skinner kind of steps in, and we're wondering... What exactly does he get out of this? What is his motivation to stop her from turning him into one of kind of uh, Hattie's kind of weird, uh, almost you know, you know, kind of almost zombieish uh, vampires? You know, these very kind of single-minded servant vampires. Um, and you know, is it just, is it because he does have this great affection for Pearl, and still somehow wants you know, is, is he again like is he like a triple agent? You know, it's it's like he's a you know he's a bad guy, then he's a good guy, then he's a bad guy again. Maybe he's becoming a good guy again. That's the thing about Skinner Sweet. That's one of the great things about this character is that he's a true original. We don't have any clue which direction he's going to go. I mean, it's really, it's like, as the wind blows, is what whichever way it will take him. Of course, he will always do what's in his best, his own self-interest, but he at least seems to have greater emotional depth than just being someone who is just always at the whims of his own self-interest. So that is something that is so compelling about the character of Skinner Sweet. But what we ultimately have here is something that we have an ending to this story that is very final, this very heartbreaking. Um, and it gives us, it, it kind of makes me wonder why this issue isn't the last one before this series takes a break for a while. I'll be sad to see this, this book take uh, however long of a hiatus that Snyder plans on taking from this book. I don't know if it's because he is kind of, you know, because he's going to be doing, you know, obviously Man of Steel soon, um, that, you know, we have all these, uh, you know, all these different books that he is so invested in, obviously, you know, with, you know, you know, with, you know, Death of the Family, with Rot World, and of course, you know, the new Superman title that he's going to be starting on soon. So, but this just... You know, Raphael Albuquerque, again, just doing amazing, you know, you know, it's hard for his work to really fit into any other world, at least to me, than this. I know he obviously did the backup stories on Batman for a while when he was going through the whole Court of Owls thing, <clears throat> and we had, uh, you know, the, the elder Pennyworth uh, stories there uh, that he was doing the art on. And I did appreciate it there, but it didn't work nearly as well as it can in this book because his work is suited much more towards the bizarre rather than kind of the more mundane. Um, and he is a, a consummate artist, though. I mean, he does some fantastic work in this issue. And Snyder just really bringing the punch home, tying it up, not in a pretty bow, not in the way that you would want, but ultimately in the way that this title needs. You know, uh, just uh, it is. It's a very sorrowful book to read, but it is a tremendous read. And again, an absolute five out of five for American Vampire number thirty-three. Um, so, uh, speaking of wrapping more things up, New Avengers number 34. Now, this, of course, is the epic conclusion to the epic run that, uh, that Bendis and Diodato have had on this book. So, basically, we have this finale of Doctor Strange versus 
the new Avengers as possessed by Daniel Drum, brother Voodoo, uh, who is looking to get back at, and finally for the first time in our understanding, that he's looking to get back at Doctor Strange. The specific reason that he gave brother Voodoo, he, he gave Jericho Drum the he gave him the title of Sorcerer Supreme, and he just didn't happen to be up to the task. And of course, this eventually ended up with uh, Jericho's death. So this is what Daniel holds Doctor Strange very much responsible for. And so we have him. He is fighting, you know, all of the New Avengers, but he can't fight them too hard because he doesn't want to hurt them because they're his fucking friends. Um, so other measures have to be taken, but does he have the ability to do it by himself? And of course, we see, you know, in the last issue, you know, we see uh, Captain Marvel lead Luke and Jessica out of the tunnels and out of the back way so they can get away from all the shit that's going down. But, come on, man, it's Luke Cage. He ain't going to abandon his buddies. Um, he knows when he has to intervene. And, of course, that's here. And we have a host of, uh, of, of guest artists helping to illustrate this epic battle, like uh, Ming Doyle, uh, Becky Cloonan. Uh, I mean, there are, like, five or six other artists other than Deodato uh, who just do, like, one page here, one page there, one, you know, so on and so forth. Um, none of them are actually, like, the returning artists, like uh, Gatos or... Um, or, or Emming or any of those guys, um, but just this whole host of just little like you know it's and 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 it ranges in style from you know the you know from the very the very you know kind of almost specifically kind of like colored pencily work to the almost cartoony bizarre uh, absurd work, um, and uh, for some reason it all works because we know this is the finale. This is the end of this run of this book. And soon we're going to be getting a new number one. Um, but damn, if, you know, Bendis and Deodato don't pull this book off really well, because ultimately what we have here is that Dr. Strange, in order to defeat Daniel Drum has to go someplace that he does not really feel comfortable going with, but ultimately needs to, and that is he has to use dark magics. Because the magics that he's been using are the ones, by and large, taught to him by the Ancient One. Makes a guest appearance here. Um, because just his ordinary magics are just not going to cut it. There's too many lives at stake. There's too many good people that are going to get hurt if, you know, because Drum is using exclusively dark magics. But, you know, Doctor Strange has a much bigger bag of tricks than anybody would give him credit for, and therefore he pulls out the dark magics to expel Daniel Drum once and for all. And with that, we get... Bequeath, you know, that the Ancient One has witnessed this along with uh, Damon Hellstrom. Uh, and in kind of spirit form. And the Ancient One appears before the, the New Avengers. And uh, because he has been able to use dark, because Strange has been able to use dark magics, but he has been able to uh, kind of withstand. Uh, the uh, the evil influence that they would presumably carry into him, uh, that he is once again bequeathed with the Eye of Agamotto, and therefore he becomes Sorcerer Supreme again. Yay! Um, so, I mean, all of this just making a more significant argument that Doctor Strange absolutely needs his own book again. Um, I just hope they get someone really good, maybe like Bendis, to write him. Uh, of course, I would love to see Brian K. Vaughn come back and do Doctor Strange, but hey, you know, I mean, that's, I think that's too much of, of the stretch. Uh, but, you know, and then we have this, this wonderful moment of, uh, you know, where, where we have, you know, there, there is this kind of tribute to Victoria Hand, obviously, uh, lost her life in this last arc here. Um, but, you know, we get everybody 
kind of saying goodbye to Luke and Jessica and the baby. Um, and, you know, Luke and Jessica come out to uh, Doreen, a.k.a. Squirrel Girl, uh, who is has some very specific and very positive words of wisdom for Luke Cage to let him, you know, let him know, yes, he's, you know, this is a guy who's come from prison to being a hero, to being an Avenger, to being a father. And he's got a pretty bright future ahead of him. And the three of them kind of walk off into the New York sunset and just, they deal with it. They're ready for the next chapter of their lives because this chapter has come to a close. And this was a wonderful finale. Um, I don't know if it could have been done better for this book. It was just, it was an excellent send off for this team. Obviously, we're going to be getting a new team soon with, uh, with Jonathan Hickman at the helm. Uh, so I know that at least one of them is going to be Black Panther. I don't know about the rest of them because I'm, I'm trying not to read too much into the new solicits. I don't want to see who's going to be kind of coming around the corner. Um, but uh, looking forward to it. But this was, again, a very, 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 very good send-off for all these guys. Five out of five for New Avengers number 34. And this brings us to our pick of the week. If you know me at all, you know what book that came out this week is coming. And that is Fatal number 10. This was... Because basically we start where we have Miles kind of ready to... Uh, and the character of Rat, I love Rat, um, ready to, you know, go onto the breach uh, to uh, to get what, uh, you know, to get what Joe needs. But we see that Miles has learned a lot more about Joe's past and who she truly is than he would have cared to. Um, that there is something else at work here and the kind of power that she has over men. And this brings us really full circle to the idea of what this book is supposed to be. And we have, again, this epic uh, fight between... Uh, you know, Hansel and all of his followers against Joe, and it is incredibly heartbreaking. But, I mean, from the moment that Miles ever crossed the path of Josephine, you know that one way or the other, he's doomed. In one form or another, he is not long for this world and it is it, it's just it was just it was it was devastating to see that because you wanted to hope against hope that somehow the good guys were really going to get out of this and just see where the world takes them but that was not to be because Josephine does know that she is cursed somehow. And we don't yet know the, the depths of this curse or how it came to be, exactly what started all of this. That is the one thing that we're still very much not clued in on, and that's fine. I am willing to take this book for its mystery. I love the fact that we don't really know that much about her, that we haven't yet confronted kind of these, you know, Lovecraftian demons that we're looking at, but we are, piece by piece, we're getting a little bit more of what we are promised in this book, is that it is about monsters. And whether they're of just the strictly human variety or whether they're of the more demonic variety, 
that they must be faced and somehow Josephine is kind of eternally cursed to keep there is no man that that whose life will not be ruined by her which is why she obviously stayed in seclusion for so long but there are still so many questions to answer because we have after the the explosive uh, climax of this book we have this uh, we have this kind of extended epilogue that brings us back into the present with Nicholas Lash and we have him desperately searching for uh, for uh, you know his uncle's manuscript and of course this road leads to again more tragedy and more madness and more ah I want to scream because it's just I mean it's so terrifying it's just like I mean this is literally this is a guy that just he met this woman once and his whole life has just been fucked and it's been and this is basically as we see what's been going on with the other characters the characters of Hank the character of Miles the cop from the first arc you know, we see where this is going. Every man that crosses her path is will share a similar fate. And whether it, if it's not death, it's a lifetime of either regret, madness, or a combination of all three. Um, and that is really a and Joe is ultimately the centerpiece of this book, and not without good reason, because she is the femme fatale. Any man who crosses her path is just, like I said, they're just, they're, they're, they're doomed. And she, and that's one of the great things about this particular issue, is that she kind of accepts this gift. She accepts this curse, and uses it to her own advantage, but in a way that, you know, you would expect, I would say, but in a way that not even maybe she was ready to use it, is that she's in, obviously, a, a life or death situation, so how best can she use her own abilities to get out of it? And, of course, it's through those actions that directly lead to the fate of Miles. I mean, in Sean Phillips' art, uh, I mean, it's just, I mean, Brubaker and, and Phillips, I mean, they're just such an incredibly potent creative team. And it's just, you can't deny that. You cannot deny how powerful these books are and how well done they are. So, yeah, Fatale number 10, pick of the week. Absolute five out of five. I mean, no doubt. So that's it for this week of new comics, bitches. So uh, you know, I'm gonna enclose a link to the video below that you will see that will take you to your iTunes library, whatever, to the iTunes application, whatever, and. Uh, I'm a little uncertain as to whether or not this directly leads you to the Shadow Gallery podcast on iTunes. <laughs> um, thanks again, man. You are sincerely you, and you know you are the shit. You are you are you are king shit right now in my book. Um, so we'll see you again next week. Uh, of course, don't forget to thumb it up or thumb it down. Don't forget to comment. Let me know that you stopped by. Let me know that you watched. Feel free to subscribe if it's your first time here. Don't forget to check out the, the iTunes podcast. It's not something that you haven't heard before, but at least it gives you the opportunity to, if you have an iPhone, you have an iPad, you can take it on the road with you. You can pause it, play it back. You can download it. You don't have to worry about, you know, pausing and coming back to the video, whatever. A lot of new, a lot of new possibilities here for you to be treated to the dulcet tones of my voice and my uh, mad ravings of <laughs> of fanboy 
uh, absurdity. So thank you so much again for tuning in, staying with me for as long as you have. Uh, I'll leave you now. And so this is James Donnelly from the Shadow Gallery saying good night, and we'll see you again soon, and reminding you as always to stay in the shadow. Stop!